There we go. Good afternoon. A very, very good afternoon from me, Tracy Lee Miller. I'm the brand and marketing executive for private property, and I'm going to be your virtual host for this afternoon session. Welcome to our first regional Mpumalanga and Limpopo Nexus. I'd like to see some of you saying good afternoon. There's a chat box on your right. Uh, let me see who said good afternoon this afternoon. Jan, thank you. Hi, Nerissa. Hi, Marena. Hello, studio. Hello, Hanley. And let me know where you are listening or tuning in from. Afternoon, Flores de Coq. I see you. Afternoon, Marion. Welcome, welcome to Nexus by Private Property. We are indeed very, very thrilled to have you. Um, Alson, hi, Alson. Welcome to Nexus, Alson Mudau. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for deciding to spend your valuable time with us today. Uh, Anna Susanna Dreyer, welcome and good afternoon. Hello, Ina. Hello, Katrain. Hello, RealNet Polokwane. She's, I think she's make, giving a shout out to the Real Net Polokwane team. Uh, let's see who else is in the room. Someone's listening from Pretoria. Oh, Narissa and David, you're tuning in from Pretoria. Chris Boeta, hello, hello, hello. You're tuning in from Groblersdal. And hello, Claudia Olivier. Nice to see you. And thank you so much for making time to join us uh, here today at the Nexus. The specific nexus is brought to you by APSA, and it has a focus on Mpumalanga and Limpopo. So thank you so much, Gertrude Riedling-Hayes. You are joining us from Krugersdorp, and we're really very happy that you are able to join us. So let me get cracking. It's a minute after one. I'm going to try and stick to time today. Um, the word nexus is a series of connections that link to or more things. And that's exactly what the Nexus events are all about. It's a series of digital connections that, um, or networking events, which cultivate human connection through knowledge sharing and networking. We hosted our first Nexus last year in November and quite a number of industry partners really gave us fantastic feedback and we decided to bring it back bigger and better than before. One way that we're doing this better this year is to tailor the events to the specific regions so that the insights are hyper-local to you and your area, giving you the best possible chance of achieving success in a tough market. We have an excellent lineup for you today, but before we get started, let me first start by pointing out a few things. This is a very interactive session. So there's a chat box here on the right hand side of your screen. With this chat box, I'm going to ask each of you to please drop in an emoji that symbolizes how you feel today. I'm going to be super predictable. That's my emoji. My emoji is a green heart and I'm followed very closely by Carl van den Berg, my colleague with his green heart as well. Hello, Magda. Vandenberg from Bella Bella, wonderful part of the world that is. Hello, Tando, good afternoon. It's wonderful of you to join us again. There we go. We've got a yellow heart there from Mar Veronica. Flores de Cock, you are old school. You're using the old school emoji. I love the little hearts in the eyes. Ina, thank you, Chris, for that one as well as your head. Awesome. Flores, well done on using the actual <laughs> the actual emoji from the from the chat now if you look right next to the chat button there's a participants button and now base i love it i love it it's a crazy tuesday isn't it hello george i see you i see the smiley face hanley from basi Buerta properties in now spread welcome welcome to this nexus in partnership with apsa and with PayProp and with a focus specifically on Mpumalanga and Limpopo, you are in the spotlight today. So on the button next to chat, you can have a look at all the participants that are here today um, in alphabetical order. And if there's anyone that you want to reach out to, you can literally just hang your cursor over their name, send them a message, or look at their profile. Um, the third button I want to draw your attention to 
is the Q&A button, of course. And that Q&A button is a button that gives us an opportunity to ask questions either anonymously or not anonymously. You can put your name in. So I'm going to ask a question. The question I'm asking is, can you guess what I'm drinking right now? Can you guess what I'm drinking? And I'm going to ask the question as Tracy. And then in the chat box, yes. Uh, your head, no, girl, we're not doing a GNT today. It's too early. Hanley Kruger, you think it's tea. Gerda, you think it's coffee. You're 100% right, Vicky and Gerda. It is indeed a cup of coffee that I got from Seattle uh, Coffee. What is it called? Seattle Coffee Company. So I think we kind of have an understanding of how this main stage works. So without further ado, I'm going to bring our first speaker onto the stage. And it brings me an incredibly great sense of pride to bring Narissa David, who is the Home Loans Regional Manager for Pretoria, Gauteng North Pretoria, Limpopo, and Mpumalanga. I think she's also representing for us today. Nerissa, how do we say? Goedemiddag. Good afternoon. Goedemiddag. Awesome. Where are you joining us from before I give the mic over to you? Where are you situated right now? Okay, so I'm actually at the office at Hatfield at our Hillcrest office park in, in Pretoria this afternoon okay. joining you. I didn't want to have any network issues. Okay, excellent. Um, so, Nerissa, you're going to take us through some of the insights from a, a regional property market perspective, as well as some interesting home loan application statistics. So, over to you. Thanks, um, Tracy Lee. It is indeed a pleasure for us to be here today and really to be representing um, APSA Home Loan. So, I hail from the northern region. And we represent uh, the greater Pretoria area, Mpumalanga, Limpopo, and the Northwest region. I'm really excited to be joining our strategic partners, private property, and, and hosting you guys here today. I'm, I'm sure we're all getting used to this virtual um, channel of communication over the last year. So let's hope we don't have any hiccups today. Um, we can move on to um, our first slide. Thank you so much. So I think for all of us. Um, when 2020 started, I, mean, I pre, uh, personally, I relocated from KZN and I was really looking forward to getting to know my industry partners and then, then COVID hit. And um, I think we all, for the first time in our lives, actually experienced that none of us have had to go through previously. And we had to adjust to a new, new normal. Um, we had to rethink in terms of how we actually embrace the industry. And for most of us, we went into level five lockdown, which meant a complete shutdown for the property market industry. When we went into lockdown, we as APSA also, I think sales was not deemed as a necessary service, but the property industry, and I think a lot of your estate agents continued to operate, which meant that it also showed a positive sign that there would be recovery for the property industry. I think most of us have also lost loved ones during this time. And I also want to pass on my condolences to any one of you that have lost loved ones due to this pandemic. And I think it's also made us stronger and more resilient. Those are some of the things that we can take out out of COVID-19. We can move over to the next slide. This is a slide that we'd like to actually call the tale of two harms. So if you look at what we experienced in the first, in H1 of 2020, we saw a decrease in application volumes. And I think this was largely due to the shutdowns of the D's office. And there were two months in the year where we lost complete productivity. And this had a huge impact on us as an industry. But as we started to move into H2, we started to see a positive uptick in application volumes. For us as EPSA, we saw unprecedented volumes, the highest volumes that we've actually seen in the last 
10 years. And we started to see the property industry started to recover. And this showed the resilience of the property market. From a deeds office perspective, I'd like to mention from in Anampumalanga and in Nelspray deeds office, we really experienced very little um, turnaround time delays from a registration perspective. And this was one of the municipal one of the deeds offices that was quite resilient during the pandemic, as well as the Polokwane deeds office. We also started to see that the quality of the customers entering the market began to improve. So we saw a good quality of customers market. 52% of the customers that actually came in actually were your first time home buyers. And we started to see the age of the applicants as well, especially from a first time home buyer perspective, started to drop from 38 between to 33 and 35. Uh, thank you. You can move on to the next slide. So what were our customers actually saying when it came to the home, uh, about home ownership? So we started to see a very positive uptick from a home sentiment index. And really what it tells us is that customers, we saw a, our highest home sentiment index since 2015, and it was at 80%. We have not seen this uptick since 2015. And I think what it really was telling us that the, the sentiment towards buying property was positive, and that is a good indication for us in the property industry. The four main, confidence, four main contributions towards the confidence increase of 4% was a result of customers really seeing the demand increase. So there was a huge demand for first time home buyer purchases. So that positively in, improved the index. And secondly, the low interest rates, the favorable interest rates also had a positive impact on the home sentiment index. We're going to further deep dive now per region. And if we can please go on to the next slide. Okay, so from a home sentiment index perspective, we looked at the four bigger industries or the three bigger regions. And here what we saw was Kauteng was at 80, 88%, and our coastal regions, Western Cape and KZN, were at 77%. We also want to acknowledge that the Western Cape was seeing one of, one of the biggest growth of 10% in terms of um, the index. And Kauteng still holds a higher sentiment when it came to the property index, really because I think Kauteng holds a higher volumes when it came to application volumes. If we look at from a um, Mpumalanga and a Limpopo perspective, Mpumalanga had a home sentiment index of 83% and Limpopo 80%. Um, I think from a buying perspective, Mpumalanga had a whopping 93% positive increase in terms of buying property and Limpopo was around 77%. I think also what we need to make note of here is from an overall property market perspective, we found that customers were looking at renovating their properties as well, as well as looking to migrate into more coastal areas as well. And that, hence you could see the increase in the Western Cape property home sentiment index as well. We can move over to the next slide, please. Okay, so what does this slide tell us? So for what we looked at was four types of customer segments. We looked at your first time home buyer, the homeowner, which is the non first time home buyer, the renter and the investor. When looking at the homeowner sentiment by these four customer types, we could see that all customer types have seen an improvement in sentiment by the end of the year, thus boosting overall cost overall confidence. The two customer types that stood out very interestingly were the existing homeowners and the investor. The existing homeowner has always lagged in comparison to the others. However, with the pandemic, we found that 
the existing homeowner found it fit either to buy a bigger property or to renovate their existing property. From an investor perspective, what we did see was that the investor pulled back in the first half of the year. And I think they were really trying to see what the economy was going to do from a renter perspective. We started to see the investor segment starting to pick up towards the latter part of the year. And we started to see that investors started to focus in, in your coastal regions such as KZN and Western Cape. At this point, I'd also like to mention that we have the buy to let value proposition that allows you to use from an investor perspective, future rental income. So we can look at future rental income for investors that are purchasing property for investment purposes. And I just want to, to mention that we are also the only bank in the industry that actually has this value propositions for the investors. Thank you. We can move over to the next slide. Okay, so here what we have seen is that the sentiments was buying property returned to 2019 levels by mid-year last year and ended 8% higher year-on-year -year comparison. This was the main driver for the increase in interest in properties. I'm also sure that you're experiencing this in the market as well because the volumes have definitely increased quite significantly. We must, however, note that the bottom line with the sentiment towards selling still recovered to 2019 level, still has not recovered, sorry, to 2019 levels. This has decreased by 7% year on year. Whilst we do not see a gradual improve, improvement, we still are, are determining what it will be at pre-lockdown levels. This means that the gap between wanting to sell versus wanting to buy continues to widen. We have seen the impact on the property value. So on this, I'd like to mention, especially from an Mpumalanga and a Limpopo perspective, that the value of properties, we actually find that they hold in the one, 1 million to the 1.5 million value band and properties that are higher in 3 million rand and above, we tend to see that we don't necessarily hold a value and I think this is largely due to the fact that this is the, the segment or the property value segment that we've seen hit the highest when it came. So the higher value band properties have been hit the hardest when it came to buying and selling of properties. Okay, uh, thank you. So what does the future hold for us? So interest rates, from an interest rate perspective, we know that we will continue to see the interest rates relatively low. The property market is one of the main stimulants towards economic growth and economic stimula stimulation. So I think we will continue to see the rates and they will gradually increase in time. And I think it all depends on the recovery of the economy. We don't anticipate that the interest rates increasing anytime soon but maybe towards the latter part of 2023. So house prices, what do we anticipate in terms of house prices? So we've seen that the demand for properties have definitely increased. Will this have an impact on selling prices? To a, to a certain degree, it might, but we're also waiting to see how this actually impacts the increase of uh, of property prices, but the demand for properties definitely outweighs the supply of properties and we do anticipate that it should have an impact on the house prices. Purchase prices, okay, so purchase prices should gradually increase as well. And I think in time we'll also begin to see what happens in this aspect. Okay, we can go to the next slide, thank you. I think we've touched on this previously. What this slide also talks around is what we touched on the second slide is really the tale of two, I mean, not two cities, two quarters. I think most, I'm not sure if many of you have read the book in terms of tale of two cities, but this is really the tale of two quarters. And it demonstrates that despite the amazing recovery in H2 in most instances, the, this was not sufficient to recover year on year fully to 2019 levels 
once again drawing to you the tale of the two halves. Okay, the top row shows you uh, where we are. From a northern region, this is where you would see the Mpumalanga and Limpopo Northwest in, uh, regions falling into. We anticipate a 4.8% growth in terms of um, the property sector. So hopefully that will still have a positive impact overall on the business. What I'd also like to mention on this, that this even moving into 2021, we had a couple of concerns from a volume perspective and from a stock level perspectives. But what we have seen is that the volumes continue to remain high. Um, the challenges that we had from a Pretoria Deeds Office, because I think some of the bonds still register in the Pretoria Deeds Office, we found that that has definitely improved in February. January for us was really a bad month. But from an Mpumalanga and a Limpopo Polokwane Deeds Office perspective, it still remains one of our strongest registration deeds office. And I think this is largely due to the fact that being a smaller deeds office, they were able to manage their workforce a lot more effectively during the pandemic. Okay, so I think also on this, um, this slide, I'd like to mention that the one thing that holds true for all of us is that buying a property is still something and remains at the heart of most South Africans. South Africans' aspirations of owning your own property remains a core aspiration. It is where your roots are placed. It is where you teach your kids to ride their bike for the first time. And it's ultimately your safe haven. It gives you pride and it helps you to build a legacy for future generations and for the future of your families. And I think this is something that South Africans hold very dear to their hearts. And we as APSA are so proud to be part of this homeowner journey with you and your customers that approach you and clients to purchase a property. Thank you. And as APSA, we want to thank you that as we aspire to house the nation in a meaningful way, we are glad to be partner partnering with private property and you, our state agents, and we look forward to, what, to the journey that 2021 holds. So from my side, I just want to thank you and over to you, Tracy. Thank you, sir. And Nerissa, thank you for sharing those insights with us. I'm going to ask uh, if you want to ask Nerissa a question. We still have a little bit of time. If not, I think we can go straight into the mentee portion of this uh, event. Nerissa, please keep your eye on the chat box. If there's a question that maybe comes into the mind of one of the delegates, they're going to pop it into that box here. And if we have time, we'll then invite you back onto the stage to to address the question. But for now, I want to thank you and wish you a wonderful afternoon. Please don't go anywhere. Stay with us. We'll be here still for another hour or so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think one more thing I wanted to share with you is that we, we like to reward engagement because engagement is about creating energy in the room. So, engagement we're going to look at here we're looking at the chat questions we're looking at you know who's if you're staying longer and you, you're still engaging with the content and we want to reward that and another one we want to reward is the best question of today so listen to the session you've got two more opportunities and then ask a question and if that question gets upvoted or if that question is a question that really makes us all think and learn, then uh, we will definitely reward you for that question. And the final thing I'd like to mention is that um, we are going to be able to give one and a half non-verifiable CPD points uh, courtesy of AISA. And to get these points, you need to stick around till the end of the session and then click on the link to register that you had attended and then we will be able to get those points to you all right so this part of the program is part of the program where we get to interact with you 
we don't like these events where we're just talking at people. So this part of the program, we are going to try to get to know you a little bit better. So what I'm going to ask you to do is take uh, take out your cellular phone, take out your phone, and then enter your name to sign up. And there's a code that you have to enter in as well. The name, the number, the number you enter is four five six two eight one three seven. I'll repeat that four five six two eight one three seven. Please enter your name, and then I'll be able to see your name coming into the Mentimeter as you log on. So let's give it a couple more minutes and see how many people we can get to um, sign up to the Mentimeter. Uh, let's see, we've got Ina, we've got Claudia, she's in, thank you so much. There's a, a couple more, Flores, thank you so much. Carl, you are in. Let's see who else can get into this uh, Mentimeter. It's a, a short little game. The answers, I will ask the questions, but the answer and options for answering will appear on your cell phone. And what you then do is select the correct answer, the answer that you want to offer, and I will read out the answer immediately. Chris, you are in. Katrain, you are in. Jane, you are in. Marina, you are in. Leticia, I see you. Who else is in? Shoki, you are in. All right, let's get a couple more people in. We have 50 people in the room, and I can see we have only got 15 people in the Mentimeter. So I think I'm going to give it a couple minutes and have a little sip of my coffee while we wait for a few more of you to join the Mentimeter. Mm. I kind of like cold coffee. Okay, there we go. More people. We've got up to 20 now. And let's give it a little bit more time. One or two more minutes. I see we also have two questions. Chris Buerta is asking, is there a backlog at the Gauteng Deeds Office? And then the second question is from Jane. How long does an estate more or less take to be finalized? First question, is there a backlog at the Gauteng Deeds Office? And then the second question is, how long does an estate more or less take to be finalized? Um, let's see if we can get those questions answered from some of the experts here in the room. But I think let's, I'm good to go, uh, studio. Let's go to the first question in the Menti Meter. The first question is, what is your job title or your role within the company? Are you a CEO, director, executive, franchise owner? Are you a principal agent, managing broker? Or are you an estate agent or property practitioner, as it will be called? Um, or are you other? Let's see what who we have in the room. Thank you so much for all those responses. Let's move on to the next Okay, there we go. People still thinking about, about their role. Second question. What type of real estate transactions do you specialize in? Boom. Did you see that? I, I, the, the, those responses came in thick and fast. A lot of you saying sales, and some of you saying sales and rentals, and fewer saying that you focus specifically or specialize specifically in rentals. I'm sure that you're going to really, really enjoy the talk that your head smut and Jan Davel from Payprop is going to treat us to next. Let's go to the next question. This is my favorite. Do you multitask when attending virtual meetings or events online? Let's see how honest we are. Somebody said, yes, I'm guilty. Another few people said, yes, I'm guilty. My mind tends to wander. The third option is, no, I'm 100% focused. And the last option is, sometimes. So it looks like the bulk of us in the room are a little bit guilty of multitasking. And honestly, this is the reason we, we have engagements such as the Mentimeter and competitions and things like that in these virtual events. The, the next question is, in your opinion, is it a buyer's 
or sell a buyer or seller's market? What do you think? Is it a buyer's market or a seller's market? And maybe if you if you if you can give me your rationale in the chat box while we wait for the next speaker to get ready and get onto the stage, get into that limo. So an overwhelming majority of you saying that it is definitely a buyer's market and potentially has to do with some of the conditions that Nerissa mentioned to us earlier. And do we have another question, Studio? How would you describe, please, and because the, the answers are in, are visible immediately. It's obviously prone to bad words. So I'm going to ask you to keep it clean, keep it tidy. In one word, how would you describe 2021? Not 2020, 2021 so far. I agree with whoever said fast. Astounding. We can see that challenging. Yes, of course, promising is a, is a good word. Too little time, very rushed, bombastic and fantastic. Promising seems to be the, the word that has been mentioned more than once. Of course, how these word clouds work is if the, the word gets entered more than once, it takes prominence. So look at that, challenging and promising coming out at the same time. I guess the old saying of nothing worth um having you know it comes easy everything with with having is worth fighting for fast promising challenging good prospects wonderful i think that's overwhelmingly quite positive let's get to the last question i think this is the last question let me see studio if you could change one thing about the south african real estate industry right now what would it be I'd love to see what your responses are. Take a little bit of time to think. There's no one rushing you. You only get one chance. One thing you change about the South African real estate industry right now, what would that one thing be? We still have no responses just yet. Let's see who is going to be first with an answer. There we go. The time between signing a contract and registration. Less admin, very, very interesting response that because, of course, for many people, property purchase um, and even property rental is such a massive, massive uh, commitment. One kind of feels like it needs that admin, <laughs> but less admin, I hear you. EAAB, EAAB, EAAB and FC, FFC and CPD. I think if you if if you have time, please stay with us for the the last part of your heads talk where she pulls Jan onto the stage and he's gonna have some incredibly important insights to share with you around the Property Practitioners Act. It's not on the agenda, but it's information that has proven to be incredibly useful to the various property or, or in this Nexus program that we've put together. The monopoly property, I can't say that name out loud, sorry, um, and the EAAB, time frame with transactions, less interest rates into electronic property registration. That's quite a diverse um, number of things that you would change about the industry. Um, I think that's it from a Menti point of view. Uh, I'd like to almost immediately call onto the stage um, your hit. Your hit, thank you so much for all of the responses. I see there's a couple of questions here. The question that Chris Buerta asked, which is, is there a backlog at the Gauteng Deeds Office? It hasn't received an upvote yet. Let's see if someone wants that question answered. And then Jane, you asked, how long does an estate more or less take to be finalized. And then the last question was, Marena, Absa, please upgrade the future rent option. Uh, very, very interesting. I think what we can do is let's take a little break and then let's use the Q&A questions as points of discussion. 
when we get to our tables. When this break that we're going to ask to have, we'll let's do a five minute break. And then let's just get everyone's opinion around the table um, on what they think. Um, is there a backlog at the Gauteng Deeds office? What has been your experience? How long does an estate more or less take to be finalized? And a question for, for APSA, I'm going to see if Nerissa can maybe answer that question for you, Marena, directly. In the meantime, go grab yourself another cup of coffee. We'll be back in exactly five minutes. Thank you so, so much for everyone that's taken the time to join the Nexus with its focus on Mpumalanga and Limpopo in partnership with ABSA. We'll be back in a short, short. And welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to Nexus Mpumalanga and Limpopo in partnership with APSA. And right now, it brings me tremendous um, pride to introduce Pay Props, your head Smiths, and she is the head of data and analytics. Your head is also joined later on by the Pay Props CEO, Jan, who will take us through the some of the rental marketing review what the future holds and also give us a sneak pre a peek into the paper up state of the rental market survey results a, a little ahead of the release which is only going to be next quarter mm -hmm. um your head are you on this there you are you're on the stage welcome welcome lovely to see you again where are you joining us from hi tracy thanks for having me i am joining from a beautiful and sunny Stellenbosch. Fantastic. Enjoy this. Thank you. Okay, everyone, I'm going to share my screen and um, stop my video on my end so that you can see um, the graphs nice and big on your screen. Um, get that screen sharing going. Just one second. There we go. All right, so as Tracy mentioned, I'm going to be telling you about what happened in the rental market in 2020. Uh, certainly with COVID and lockdown, it was a very interesting year and that reflects in the figures. So I'll be covering a few topics, uh, starting with the rent, then we'll look at the rears, uh, credit metrics, and then also I'll give you a sneak preview of the paper of state of the rental industry survey. Let's jump right in with rent. On your screen, you'll see inflation in blue and rental growth in red. Uh, this is a year on year measure. So, for example, if we look at December, uh, that represents the change in the rental price from December 2019 to December 2020. So as you can see, rental growth uh, trended below inflation for the past two years. And in November 2020, we saw the first negative rental growth for the first time since we started tracking this back in 2012. So it was just 0.3% year on year, uh, which was equal to a 10 Rand reduction in rent over the year but still um, something worth mentioning. Why was the rental market under such immense pressure in 2020? So there are a few reasons for this. Um, on the demand side, we have obviously after COVID uh, affordability issue. I'm sure we all know someone who either lost a job or had to take a pay cut or had a spouse or a partner lose a job. So affordability within a household played a, a big role in this. When tenants have smaller incomes, they aren't necessarily able to afford their larger rental increases and they also won't be looking around to move to larger and more expensive properties. That puts downward pressure on the price because the demand is a bit lower. On the supply side, we saw many Airbnb properties um, being moved from the short-term rental market to the long-term rental market because of travel restrictions. So these properties were sitting empty and the owners moved them to the long-term market uh, so that they can get at least some sort of income on this. 
Another factor was the low interest rate um, that made it so attractive for investors to buy more buy to let properties. And both of these factors meant that there was an oversupply of rental properties in the market, further putting downward pressure on the price. Now, if we look at basically the same rental growth information as in the previous slide, just quarterly, and we add a trend line, we can clearly see uh, what we saw on the previous slide, and that is that rental growth has been trending downward for the past six quarters. Um, for most of 2019, it trended between 3.9, 4 so between 3 and 4 percent for most of 2019, and even into 2020. And then at the end of quarter one, uh, lockdown hit uh, almost a year ago, and you can clearly see the effects of that on the rental growth. In the last quarter of 2020, rental growth measured only 0.2%. And again, that means that from the fourth quarter of 2019 to the fourth quarter of 2020, the average rent increased by only 0.2%. Right, if we look at provincial statistics against the national, you can see that not going so great in Limpopo, the rent is actually getting cheaper year on year um, and it has been doing so for the past eight quarters at least, and I think two before, um, before 2019 that you can't see. Ended the year at 3.3% decrease in the rental price, um, and this was the lowest um, rental growth out of all the provinces. Looking at Mpumalanga, at the beginning of 2019, um, the province actually outperformed the national average, and then took a dip in the middle of 2019. And we are, we are seeing rental growth trend between 2% and 1% um, since then. Actually uh, outperformed national rent in the last quarter at 1.4%. So to put this into perspective, five provinces out of the nine experienced negative rental growth in the last quarter of last year. In other words, rent got cheaper from the last quarter of 2019 to the end of 2020. So you'll see here Limpopo is the lowest, Gumalanga is right up there with some of the highest, um, and you can also see the average rental price here for Limpopo, 7, uh, 6,900, and Gumalanga, 7,500, both below the national average of 7,800. Moving on to arrears. So obviously with um, tenants losing income or some of their income, these figures spiked quite a bit during 2020. When we look at arrears, we look at two metrics. We first look at the percentage of tenants in arrears, and then we look at the average arrears size relative to rent. So let's start with the first one. At the beginning of last year, just before lockdown, almost 20% of tenants were in arrears. Then lockdown was announced and that jumped up to 25%. So in the second quarter, one out of four tenants were in arrears. Good to see that that um, started um, improving towards the end of the year, ending at 20.9%, not quite yet at pre-lockdown levels. If we consider the other metric, at the beginning of last year, a tenant in arrears on average owed almost 80% of one month's rent. That increased to 104% in the third quarter and again improved in the last quarter, but is still quite a way off three lockdown levels. This metric is a bit more sticky and I'll tell you why in a second. So the reason for the, for the movement or the trend that we see in, in these metrics, I think it's understandable that when lockdown was, was announced, uh, tenants weren't necessarily sure what their cash flow was going to look like for the next few weeks. Um, at first, we thought a few weeks and then it turned into a few months. So it's very possible that they stopped paying their rent in full. And then in May, it was announced that the economy will open and uh, everyone could go back to work on the 1st of June, those who didn't lose their jobs. And they started paying their rent in full and where possible paid off their arrears. 
Looking at the average arrears, this peaked in only in the third quarter. So mathematically, all these tenants who could go back to work and could pay off their arrears did so. And when those low percentages um, are gone, then mathematically the average will actually increase. So that's why we saw that spike in the third quarter. It's difficult to get that figure down because if you think about it, to get that figure down to owe a smaller percentage of your rent, you have to pay your rent in full and then you have to pay off on your rental arrears. And in the current economic climate, that is difficult for many tenants to do. If we compare provincial figures to the national figures, for Limpopo, we can see that the same trend was followed. So again, spiked in the second quarter and then improved down to the last quarter, but the levels aren't quite yet where they were um, at the beginning of the year, although they're not too far off, luckily. Then if we look at the average size of arrears, the story is a bit different. On average, Limpopo tenants owe more than the national average. This actually peaked in the second quarter and then again improved to, through to the fourth quarter. At the end of the year, tenants in Limpopo um, who were in arrears owed just over one month's rent. Moving on to Mpumalanga, these figures actually look quite good. Uh, started the year off below the national average at 17.3%, spiked in the second quarter, and then ended below the national average at 19.5. So still a bit off from where it started at the beginning of last year, but definitely improving. Looking at the average area size, again, same trend was followed, spiked in the third quarter, ended below the national average, and at the end of the year last year, Mpumalanga tenants who were in arrears owed 90% of one month's rent. Moving on to our credit metrics. So these figures are pulled from all the credit checks that are done through the pay crop system. So this is when a tenant applies for a rental property, um, our clients will do a credit check. So it doesn't necessarily track the group of tenants who are already living in a property. It looks at the credit profile of someone applying to rent a property. So keep that in mind when we um, interpret these stats. We look at quite a few metrics, everything from income to debt to income ratio. And of course, the important one is the credit score. And I just want to touch on a few of these. Looking at major delinquency. So a tenant with a major delinquency either has a default or a notice against them, or they are more than three months in arrears on any one of their accounts. This increased a bit in the second quarter and then recovered nicely down to the last quarter of, of last year. Um, and the second one that I actually want to highlight is the debt to income ratio. We all know that the repo rate dropped by three and a half basis points last year, which is really a significant reduction. And you can see the effect of that on the debt to income ratio. At the beginning of last year, tenants spent almost half of their net income on their debt repayments. And at the end of last year, um, that has decreased to 40% of their net income. That obviously makes a huge uh, difference on someone's um, cash flow, and that is reflected in these figures. Of course, if you have more, if you spend less on debt, you have more money left at the end of the month, and that is what we're looking at here when we look at disposable income. So the percentage of the tenants' um, net income increased over the year. Looking at credit scores in general, so that is basically the summary of someone's credit health, and that actually increased over the year. It improved, even though it was only by three points, but it is really good to see that it improved over the course of the year, um, only dipped by one point there in the second quarter. Comparing the provinces to national, and I again, don't want to hammer on this, I just want to highlight the, the few important differences. Debt to income ratio, you can see 48% spent on debt in Limpopo, as opposed to 40% nationally. They have tenants in Limpopo have a slightly 
a smaller percentage of disposable income left at the end of the, at the, end of the month at, uh, in quarter four. And then slightly behind the national average on credit scores, but really not a major trend smash at 6.43 compared to the national number of 6.45. In Mpumalanga, we also see that tenants are spending more on debt um, than the national average at 50%, but it is worth noting that at the beginning of last year, it was at 56%. Tenants only have 22% of their net income left after paying their debt and their rent. And here, unfortunately, we can see a significant difference in credit score. Um, the overall credit health of tenants in Mpumalanga it's nine points below the national average of 6.45. Looking at major delinquencies, we can see that 27% of tenants, so more than one in four tenants, actually have a major delinquency against their name compared to 18% nationally. So why did credit metrics improve in 2020? And when I say credit metrics, I actually mean the overall health. So we now look at the credit score. And there are a few possible reasons for this. This is just um, educated guessing. It's possible that the lower income tenants, and I think we all know from reading the news and listening to the radio, that lower income tenants were actually harder hit by lockdown um, than tenants in the, in the um, high income brackets. And it's possible that these tenants moved out of the rental market in the short term. So either they moved in with friends and family, um, and they haven't had the means to start renting again. So that's why there aren't fresh credit checks done on these tenants. Um, and that could be why the figures are actually looking better. Tenants could also be staying for longer. And that um, goes back to the affordability issue we discussed earlier. They could be staying in the um, rental properties for longer and not moving to bigger properties. And again, no, new, no fresh credit checks done on these. So that could also push up the credit metrics. Lastly, and I'm hoping that I'm not just optimistic, but that I'm realistic as well, hoping that tenants are financially more responsible after COVID. I think everyone got a bit of a fright when lockdown hit and hopefully we're all thinking about our finances a bit differently, have a bit more um, money to spend due to the lower interest rates so hopefully that is one of the reasons. So I was expecting to see the credit matrix worsen, um, also because good tenants with the lower interest rates are actually buying property and they're moving out of the rental market, but it is good to see that there are good tenants still available in the market, even after COVID, to fill all the rental properties. Now for the fun part, the pay prop state of the rental industry survey results. At the end of last year, we conducted the second survey only, um, and I nitpicked a few of the best results to share with you here. So who took part in this survey? We sent it to all pay prop clients and um, everyone who signed up for a rental index and other industry players. 95% works in the property industry. 69% of participants were either business owners or rental agents. And then 64% managed um, rental books less than 150 properties. So they're not massive books. Um, they manage 150 properties or less. The first category was technology, and this really should come as no surprise. 55% of um, participants said that they increased the use of technology in their business during COVID. And of course, with people being forced to work from home, um, this really is not a surprising statistic at all. 70% said that virtual viewings and 3D tours are here to stay. And I think we've all, we've all seen great technology in this field. Um, so yeah, that's here to stay according to 70% of our participants. 69% said that it will be more productive to increase automation than to increase the workforce. So that is a great example of working smart and not working hard. Looking at the rental portfolios over the year, 
a full 70% of respondents said that the increases that they put through on rentals were lower last year than in other years. That again boils down to the affordability issue that we spoke about earlier. 93% said that they have made payments arrangements with tenants. This just shows you just how many tenants were actually affected by loss of income during lockdown. 55% said that they have more vacant properties now than they used to have. And 64% said that they have lowered their commission in order to keep a mandate. This is a bit of a problematic number if you think that in a rental portfolio, your commission income is your main stream of income. And once you've lowered that commission percentage, it really is difficult to raise it again. So just something to keep in mind before you lower your commission, just know that you might not be able to raise that percentage in the near future. Looking at challenges quickly, the biggest challenge for rental agents are, is finding good tenants. That is the single biggest challenge. And then 68% of our respondents said that they are worried about the ongoing effect of COVID-19. That obviously um, it covers a whole bunch of things from cash flow to viewings to technology, you name it. Not all news is bad news, luckily. The last question was how optimistic are our uh, participants about the future of the rental market? Only 5% said that they are pessimistic. 17% said that they were neutral about this. And a whopping 78% said that they are actually optimistic about the future of the rental market. I looked at the previous year's results and there, pre-COVID, 62% of people said that they were optimistic about the future of the rental market. So maybe COVID made us all think a bit differently about life and what to be grateful for, but it's good to see that uptick in that statistic. For more information, you can download the Pack Up Rental Index. Um, on that link, I'll drop it in the chat box in, in a moment. And then I'll also answer your questions in the chat box if there are any. Handing over to Jan, who will tell you a bit about the future of the rental market. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, you hit. If we could maybe, there we go. If we can, there we go. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, lovely to, to share time with uh, property professionals of Mpumalanga and Limpopo. I'm delighted to see a couple of familiar faces, familiar names. I've already chatted privately to quite a few of you. Awesome to see you. Pity we can't meet in person, but hopefully we will be back in that environment again. Well, it is our privilege and uh, Always a pleasure to participate in a private property event, and I want to thank Amasi, Tracy Lee, Carl, Ben, and the rest of the awesome team at Private Property for affording us this opportunity. Now, ladies and gentlemen, today I'm not going to uh, do a PowerPoint presentation. Should I have done that, I probably would have had to title it Death by PowerPoint, because I am going to talk to you very briefly about uh, legislation and regulation to see what the future holds and I'm going to talk specifically about the regulations the draft regulations to the property practitioners act now as you all know this act was promulgated or published already on 3 October 2019 but that being the case you may be wondering why we as estate agents are still working in accordance with the old act the estate agency affairs act of 1976 now, I think we will all agree that this 45-year-old piece of legislation is overdue for replacement. So why are we still following it? The problem is that the Estate Agency Affairs Act dates back to an era before the internet, before digital marketing, before social media, and very importantly, also before automated and integrated payment platforms such as Paycrop. The old act simply does not cater for these uh, realities of today and the new act is not in operation yet. So what can we expect? Well, considering the Property Practitioners Act and all other new legislation, we must remember that 
any new act in itself only sets out broad principles of the new law. It does not deal with the implementation. That is where regulations to an act come in, setting out the implementation and the application of the new act. Now, although the new Property Practitioners Act was published already in October 2019, its regulations have not been finalized or published. Only once these regulations are published in the Government Gazette will the Act be implemented, and that's when we also need to follow it. And when is it likely to be published? We don't know. But what we do know is that the draft regulations to the Property Practitioners Act were published for public comment already in March last year. But due to COVID-19 and the lockdown regulations, the opportunity to submit comments, and we all participated in that, that opportunity was extended until November last year, 20 November to be specific. And since then, we haven't seen or heard much. Once it's published, it will bring the new act to, into operation. And now it's important to look at what we can expect. It is important to note that I am going to point out a few of uh, only two sections of the new act. And I'm going to refer you very specifically to uh, a, a regulation in the draft regulations. I'm not trying to give you legal advice. My advice is that you seek legal advice, that you have a conversation with your auditor and to see whether you can benefit from these regulations. And I expect that there might be good news to some of you who participate in the rental um, property market. I am going to share my screen and I'm not going to navigate too much. I'm trying to going to avoid trying to make you seasick. I just want to show you that what I am quoting and reading to you does in fact exist. It is the new act and it, it is the new draft regulations. It's all public uh, documents. It's published on the internet. Feel free to have a look. There are only three numbers you need to remember. I'm going to start with section 54 of the Property Practitioners Act, and I'll be looking away at my screen. Um, section 54 of the new Act is basically, or in essence, the same as what you know as section 32 of the Estate Agency Affairs Act. It deals with trust monies, short-term trust money, longer-term trust money, and although it's slightly more comprehensive, it is materially the same as what you know and understand under Section 32 of the old Act. I'm just going to, I'm not going to read it verbatim in the, in, in the essence of time, and uh, it is quite comprehensive, but I will just highlight a few salient points. Section 54 starts off saying that every property practitioner must open and keep one or more separate accounts, and it must be referring to certain bank sections. And immediately after opening such a trust account, you must appoint an auditor, and then you must immediately notify the authority. Now that's different. The authority here is the new name for the EAAB. You must notify them of all these trust accounts and your auditor. And then it carries on in subsection 2 to say that similar to section 32 sub 2, you can have other savings or interest bearing accounts, or amounts that will be kept in trust for longer periods. And then it goes on and it goes on to say what you must do and must do. And for those of you who prefer reading the Act in other languages, it is also available there. And then subsection, uh, subsection 6 it tells you that uh, after receipt of an audit report, you must do this and the other. Then the authority might do certain things, a court might do certain things. And that carries on. I don't, I don't want to dip into that details, but it is important for you and your auditor and your legal advisor to have a look at these draft regulations and to ensure that you do comply with the provisions of this uh, regulations that will be applicable on us uh, in the near future. What is more important, and I'm not going to scroll, I've got a different screen open, I'm going to take you to section 23 of the Act. And this section 23, subsection 1, reads a bit awkwardly in that it talks of something that we haven't seen before. And it says that a property practitioner whose turnover is below 2.5 million rand must cause his, her, or its accounting records to be subjected to an independent review by a registered accountant 
subject to certain provisions. Now, what is different here is there's a threshold of 2.5 million in your, in your turnover. Then it says an independent review by a registered accountant. It doesn't speak of, doesn't talk of a formal audit by an accredited chartered accountant, which is quite significant. Then if we consider the contents of se uh, subsection 2, it says the minister may, by notice in the Government Gazette, deter determine the circumstances under which certain property practitioners, and you will now, by now know that that is estate agents, may be exempted from keeping trust accounts. Quite interesting and new. And then further, the minister may, by notice in the Government Gazette, determine a different dispensation for the review of accounting records for those who are exempted. So this shows the intention of the legislator. And what is important now is for us to have a look at the regulations, which are still draft regulations, to see whether this in, how this intention is going to be implemented and how it's going to work in practice. So I'm now, so what we, where I started was section 54. This was section 23 that introduces a new legislative framework in terms of which certain property practitioners can be exempted from having trust accounts, or keeping trust accounts, and having it audited. The relevant regulation in the draft regulations of 2020 is regulation 4. And as you can see, the heading is exemption from trust accounts. Now, pursuant to the provisions of section 23 of the Act, that's the section I've just read to you, the following is prescribed. A property practitioner is exempted from keeping a trust account if that property practitioner has never received any trust monies other than as permitted in regulation 4.4, which we shall deal with shortly. And a property practitioner is exempted from keeping a trust account if he no longer receives any trust monies other than as permitted in regulation 4.4. And, very importantly, it's always and, if that property practitioner submits to the authority an affidavit in a specific form, in terms of which that affidavit, the practitioner asserts that he meets certain criteria. Now, I'm not going to deal with all the details of that. You can, uh, you're welcome to have a read through. It's all very um, uh, simple and it's, it all makes sense, uh, quite achievable. And what is important is that Underneath the specific uh, regulations, there is a top template document that shows you exactly what all the averments are that you need to make. Now, let's say somebody who wants to be exempted have followed those. It's all subject to um, the subsection or sub regulations to follow. Now, what is important when we look at regulation 4.2, it says that where a property practitioner is exempted in terms of the above. Such property practitioner will not be required to again have such an account review or audited. So you can have it wrapped up, parked, and it's in, end of the story. Regulation 4.3, where a property practitioner is exempted in terms of the above, such property practitioner will be exempted from having to have his business and other accounts audited and will only be required to have such accounts independently reviewed by a registered accountant. It's a far simpler and a far cheaper process subject to you meeting the criteria. Now, 4.4. This is the most important one and this is where rental agents really need to consider their options. A property practitioner will further be exempted. So this is after all the above and Regardless of the threshold of a turnover of 2.5 million rand, any property practitioner who is otherwise compliant with all these regulations and the Act may be exempted from operating his own trust account if such property practitioner is otherwise compliant, meeting everything, and if such property practitioner has mandated another property practitioner 
that specializes in collecting and distributing trust payments. And such a, a, a property practitioner will be called a payment processing agent. And that's typically a service provider like PayProp. And that this payment processing agent then needs to process such trust payments on the property practitioner's behalf in respect of all trust funds received by that property practitioner. In other words, you must use a payment processing agent who is firstly a property practitioner himself, obviously with a valid FFC and who is otherwise compliant, and such a payment processing agent must process all your trust funds. You may not have a trust, an active trust account yourself, it must be wrapped up as explained above. Then subsection 4.2 you may be exempted if each payment processing agent mandated by you, the property practitioner, operates a trust environment that complies with the Act and associated regulations. Now, what is important here is the trust environment. Your payment processor, the pay props in your life, must operate a trust environment that is auditable in its entirety, the entire environment, all estate agencies, all landlords, all tenants, all trust monies must be uh, auditable in one trust environment. We then move on to subsection, sub-regulation 4.3. Each payment processing agent, that's the PayProp and the likes, and each of the client accounts operated by the processing agents are audited annually in compliance with the Act and regulations and the audit reports in respect thereof are submitted to the authority in compliance with the Act and the regulations. If we unpack, unpack that, like I've said, it's the entire trust environment that needs to be audited and the report needs to go to the authority, which is the EAIB, and then each of the client accounts operated by the, by the pay props of this world are to be audited annually and submitted to the authority and everybody needs to be compliant. Now, what is important here is 4.4.4. The trust environment, holistically, and each of the estate agency's accounts operated by the payment processing agent must be audited, audited annually and the reports must be submitted, but each of these must be separately auditable. And I think I've missed 4.4.3 because that's where it says, separately auditable client accounts, both in respect of each property practitioner, in other words, each estate agency, and as well as uh, in respect of each client of each such property practitioner. In other words, must be separately auditable also in terms of every single landlord and every single tenant, which means there must be a proper segregation of trust funds and each of those client accounts must be auditable separately. And like I've said earlier, also holistically in a complete trust environment. And once all these sub-regulations are being complied with, you as the estate agency, the property practitioner concerned, also must hold no trust monies whatsoever outside of the manner provided for what we've discussed here. So that, and if we then scroll down, there's an Annex E1. It's an example, it's a template that you need to complete should you want to apply for exemption. It's an affidavit that says that you comply with all the above mentioned. So should you use the right payment processing agent and should you be otherwise compliant and follow all these steps, you can bypass the onerous and expensive obligation of keeping a trust, your own trust account, and have it, having it audited annually. And the good news is that even in the absence of all these new regulations, PayProp has been compliant with all of this all along for the past 16 years. All of our clients received, or received, have been receiving audit assistance, and we're quite comfortable that our clients will soon all be able to apply for exemption as envisaged in this, uh, these regulations. And on that note,
That's all from me. Thank you so much, Tracy B. Back to you. Let me uh, introduce myself. I see Tracy's um, got a couple of connectivity issues. Um, give me a couple of thumbs up in the comments box just to make sure that you can hear and see me. That would be great. Uh, wow, Tracy. Perfect. So let me introduce myself. My name is Carl Vandenberg. I'm the Business Development Executive at Private Property. And it's real. It's really is an absolute privilege to be able to spend some time with everybody today, albeit virtually. We obviously prefer the, the physical world where we can sit down, have a coffee, and engage with you and share our experiences and our knowledge. But uh, as private property, we, we're really happy with this platform, and it's an amazing way for us to actually still connect with a wider audience and um, just really be able to share all of our stuff. So I've got a couple of short um, slides that I'm wanting to talk through really sort of focusing on what is the private property of now and what is our role going to be going in, into the future. And that'll be followed by Claudia Ulifid, uh, who's our provincial head, and she'll start sharing some information around um, what it is that we're seeing in your exact provinces. So let's start off with, you know, who is, what are we choosing to be as private property? Well, essentially we're choosing to be a trusted partner in real estate. Um, much like what you're seeing now, we're in the center of an ecosystem, right? So Nexus is, an ex is a perfect example of it, where we've brought through our, our connections with our partners, such as EBSA and PayProp, and brought them to the fold to be able to share their knowledge and information with yourselves as, as real estate. So that's the exact um, sort of replication of what it is that Power Property is choosing to be, really in the center of the ecosystem. By way of example, we've got really two big things that, um, that we focus on. On the one side is the consumer, and we would classify the consumer as somebody that's searching for properties either to buy and rent. And on the other side, we've got our partners and our real estate clients and our conveyancing attorneys, banks, mortgage originators, and everybody else in the industry. And we sort of got to follow a bit of a tightrope with balancing the needs and wants of both, of both parties. By way of example, if we lean a little bit too much and really just cater for exactly what industry and real estate is wanting, we run the risk of losing our consumer base. And what happens with consumers if we're not engaging well with them is they merely just vote with their feet and find other avenues to find their information. And likewise, if we're too consumer centric, we start alienating our clients. So it really is a bit of a tightrope, but it's something that we choose to be and something that we really are good at. What's, uh, how do we get there in terms of being a trusted partner? Well, it starts off with being completely customer obsessed, completely understanding exactly what we need as real estate partners and what our consumers need, the types of information. And again, as an example, we've got almost 550,000 people following us on our Facebook page. We have daily podcasts, and all we do on those daily podcasts is share the information that we have and our partners have. We understand and we're getting to a, 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 understand it even better now around exactly what it is that a consumer wants and they want information so we play into those needs we obviously also need to understand the frustrations and the needs of our, our real estate clients and once we understand these these needs and wants we can then start solving problems and we need to solve them using digital technology and we're very much in that in that phase now and i'll share a little bit more information around how it is that we intend to solve these real world problems that are that everybody in the ecosystem has and again, once we started getting there, then we start creating the real fun stuff. And it's around creating valuable propositions for everybody. Um, by way of an example, we had a suggestion in the Nexus event yesterday morning around, I think it was one of the pain points that the state agent was having saying, you know, they wish that um, clients, when they sign an off to purchase, that they had a, a, an approval of principle. That way, you know that they, they're quite serious. 
And that's exactly the vision that we have as part of property. You know, can you imagine a world where when we send you a lead for somebody that says, I, I want to see this property, I want to go and view it. And when we send that lead to you, we tell you that they've been pre-approved already by APSA. We tell you that they're wanting a three bedroom house and whatever it is. We tell you that they've got 2.5 children and a cat and a dog. And that's valuable information. We've got to move away from where we are now, where we just flood you with, with um, leads. Most of them are of, of okay quality. It's just, we need to start not worrying about the quantum of leads, but the quality of leads. And essentially, digital technology and what it is that we're embarking on as a business is really going to separate the, the buyers from the shoppers. And that's what, exactly what it is that you, you're wanting to see. So where are we now? Well, we sort of two years on into our five-year strategy. And what we want it to be at the end of our five-year strategy is to have five million unique users coming onto our portal every month. Um, we're, where we are now, we're at about 3.2 million average, which is significantly higher than where it is um, that we were expecting to be at this time of the year. Um, just by way of illustration as well, if we consider last year, uh, around um, where we were this time last year, we've grown by over a million unique South Africans that are coming onto our portal. If you go back two years, we've grown that by more than two million unique users. And you would have seen it. You would have seen it, and we hear it from all of our real estate partners, that there's absolute, that they've seen an absolute growth and an absolute turnaround in power property, which we're incredibly proud of. And it's just the start of it. The slide you're seeing there is just really a, a quick snapshot of our, um, of our strategy uh, for the next five or well, for the five years. 2019 was really around preparation. Um, we got a new CEO in, he brought in a new executive team of which I'm one of them. Uh, and we've all come in with, a, with different backgrounds and we spent 2019 really just thinking around what it is that we wanted to do in this business and where it needs to go. 2020 was our foundation year and it was a massive year for us. Obviously, for all of us, it was, it was full of hardship and it was full of struggle, but there was massive wins and massive achievements as well. 2021 is our watershed moment, and that's really around innovation. It's where we're going to start bringing in some really great technology into your world and our consumers' world, and I'll share a little bit more information on that just now. 2022 is repositioning, 2023 is optimizing, and then it really starts talking to scale. And scale is where, the, where we need to go as a business. We've got the right market share, we've got the right balance of consumers, and then we can really grow and give complete and utter value through to everybody in the ecosystem. You would have noticed uh, about this time, it's almost exactly a year in March, we moved away from the blue, red, and white, and we're very much a different organization. I, I can't even remember being that old brand. I only know us as green. You would have seen our hearts are green in the comments there. And it, for us, it's not just a, uh, a brand change or a brand refresh and we've got a different color. It's very much also about how it is that we show up in the, in the community, how it is that we engage with our consumers. Uh, and you would have seen this again in our Facebook pages, you would have seen how it is that we engage with yourselves. So it's, it's not just a brand refresh, it's a complete departure in our old way of working. We're a 22 year old business and really our anniversary was last year. And this is, our, uh, this is year one of our, of our new life. Uh, in terms of, so I want to spend a little bit talking around prop techs and fintechs. Uh, and uh, uh, that's it's something that we need to, to grapple with. You know, we're in an age of technology, but we need to understand what role technology has in our, in our world. When we speak around fintech, which is financial technology, and in our case, prop tech, which is property technology. First, we would understand where are we? Are we evolving in terms of technology or is it an absolute revolution in terms of technology? So as an example, if you look at evolution, well, let's take, take an example. So everybody remembers having a Nokia 2110. You hold that Nokia 2110 up and you hold up your new, uh, your new iPhone 12. There is a massive difference in the technology, the speed of computing and all the rest of it. But then consider that Nokia 2110s were 25 years ago. So it seems when you just compare the two that it's an absolute revolution in technology, but it really isn't. It's a slow and changing and evolving uh, use of technology. As an example of a revolution, 12 months ago, I was sitting in our private property offices in Amschlanger Rocks in, in Durban with 180 degree sea views. Now I'm in my home office, I'm waiting for my kids to barge through the door and join the meeting and tell everybody that they're hungry or whatever it might be, but it's our new way of life. 
most of us didn't know what Teams was. We didn't know what any of this technology was a year ago. It's not very much part of our lives. That is an absolute change and a revolution in technology. What's really, really important to note is this, is that consumers have changed. We might be struggling with change. We might be slow with our change. But the consumers, the new shoppers out there of property, whether it's to buy or rent, have changed. If you have a look, there's a massive need around virtual reality, on platforms, around Matterport. Consumers want to really interrogate a property before it is that they make any choices around viewing it and the rest of that. If you have a look at our Facebook stuff that we've been doing, every now and then we'll showcase some of your properties on our Facebook page. Every time we showcase a property, we get almost 15,000 hits per property. That is extraordinary numbers. We actually had a, show, a virtual show house the other day. We had over 500,000 people view their property. This is a rapid departure from the norm. And we as part of property, and yourselves as real estate, need to make sure that we're ahead of this because our consumers are changing. That brings me to, to building a, a modern platform. In the next couple of months, you'll start engaging with us quite differently. We are rapidly changing our technology and what it is that we're going to be doing for both consumers and yourselves as real estate. So in the next couple of months, we'll be launching a brand new platform for consumers. And that is, it's going to simplify how it is a search for property, better filtering, understanding the areas better. And finding your properties a lot easier than what they currently do. And it will be web-based as well as app. What we also have is we'll be launching a proper um, real estate app and um, uh, web-based uh, service as well for real estate. That way you'll be able to get information like you'll be sharing with you now at your fingertips. We can tell you what the market shares are like. We can tell you the lead performance. Where are the people coming from? So the two need to work in tandem. And you know, it's, it's, it'll be slow progress, but we'll get to that point after launch where we can start really giving you that rich information from a consumer and really handing it to you on a silver platter, which is really what it is that we need to do. Um, again, I, I talk around that, that example around having a pre-approval. So when we send you that lead, you know that person's good to go for credit. That's value and that's what we need to start striving for. We'll be sharing this, a lot more information with you over the next couple of months. There needs to be a, quite a bit of change management. It is a very different um, way of us doing business. So we'll engage with you and we'll share a lot of this information over the weeks and months to come. Uh, I just want to talk around humanizing digital strategies. So, you know, we, we talk around disruption when it comes to technology. And I get a, a sense that when we say the word disruption, that it's it's seen in quite a negative context. In our world, a lot of people, when we talk around, you know, uh, uh, disrupting real estate, it, it, everybody goes, well, that's a, a play to, you know, cut out the middleman, cut out the real estate agent, cut this out. It's, it, it's not that, and it can't be that. Definitely not in our country. We know this. We know that property ownership in this country. We know that it's the single biggest property purchase anybody will do. And we know that the difference anything makes is the human. It's the human that's the estate agent. It's the buyer that's a human. It's a seller that's a human. It's the registering and transferring attorneys that are human. It's around making sure that we humanize this by bringing the people in at the right time with the right information. It's not about cutting anybody out. So really, this is our journey over the next couple of months. We're looking really, really forward to, to sharing this with you. Again, what will happen over the next couple of months is we'll launch a few things. We'll engage with real estate. What do you like? What don't you like? And then we'll start every two to four weeks. There'll be updates. It's a, it's a bit of a, it's not quite a sprint and it's definitely not a marathon, but we'll get to that point where we just are in this wonderful ecosystem where everything just works exactly how it is that we need it. So again, thank you to our partners for joining us today. Thank you to all of you for, for spending the afternoon with us. And we look forward to seeing you again, hopefully in the, in the real world. But if not, we'll definitely be engaging quite often on Nexus. Uh, thank you. I think uh, to the studio, you'll be bringing up um, Claudia now. Huh? Thank you, Carl. Thank you very much for taking us through what um, the private property brand has in store. And while we wait for Claudia, I just wanted to acknowledge some of the questions that's been asked here in the Q&A box. And there are some responses that I'm happy, happy to take you through once Claudia has done her talk. Claudia, where are you joining us from, sis? Um, I'm in Pretoria, born and bred. 
So yeah, awesome. from home today. Awesome. Over to you, Claudia. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to be talking to you today. Um, it's such a nice platform and to have us all in a room with a facility like this provides an opportunity that, let's be honest, we didn't really have to get so many people together in what is now commonly referred to as pre-pandemic times. So I hope you like the platform because we will be doing a lot of things with big, big rooms and crowds in the future. Um, I'm the provincial head for Gauteng, Pumalanga and Limpopo, and I will be sharing some information and tracking and performance data with you today. It's not going to be long, but it's really, really good. So I think let's get on with it. We'll start with Limpopo and with the sales performance tracking, which is obviously of great interest to you. These are remarkable numbers. You will see that since 2018, the views have increased substantially and really, really exponentially, and as did the leads as well. So the views indicate that there is a lot of interest and it has increased. And thank you for putting your stock on private property because it just widens the scope of possibility. Just so you know, 2021 is not on here because we have merely done January, February to date are the two completed months, but things are really, really looking good. Sales views are just over 265,000 until the end of February, and we are very close to sending you um, 11,000 leads. So it's really looking well. And if we can take a look at the rentals, which track quite well with what UH shared with us earlier and what we know of the market, there has still been an increase in views and interest over the last, um, the last year, 23% after the 36% increase from 2018 to 2019. And as to the rental views, we have had in excess of 140,000, which even though conversions aren't that many, it does show that there is definite interest to see what is out there. As to leads, 28% in the previous year is really good. And 2019 to 20, as far as rentals are concerned, again, tracking with the national data and trends, not a lot, but it is not negative. To date, um, we have generated around 12,000 leads and 140,000 views. So there's definitely, definitely action. The next slide will tell us about the top 50 searched suburbs. So I went and I did a little bit of research on all of these additional to what I know. And oh, yeah, my hands start going. Um, what it indicates is very positive because it is literally across all LSM groups, across all price ranges, and a broad scope of interest around, um, as far as the different parts of our communities um, are concerned. So Bendor is a good example, which is the suburb that gets the most searches. And if you know it, you will know that it is mostly residential, but has properties in all price classes. And that goes for the entire province. Warm Boss will, um, as mainly interest is a lot of international investor and then second homes for weekends and holidays. Bulukwane, which is a hub, that'll always, always do well. And there's a lot of development there. Morimole, opportunities for people that are ready to settle down. So the province caters for all sorts and the interest has been very, very broad. Of course, if you would like to know more and how to enhance your exposure in certain suburbs, then Ina de Vinar is available and we will, I'll tell you a little bit more about her a little later on. The next slide can sound very serious, but it's not really. It's also indicates a constant. So I'm sure all of you know this, 
but the median price is the middle point of property prices in an area or a neighborhood. Statistically, it is the best indicator to determine property prices and to measure them per suburb, area, province, and nationally like we did. What you will see, the top one, the black line, is the national median on private property. Limpopo tracks slightly lower, which implies that it's more affordable. But on the sales side, what is quite pos um, positive is the increase showed um, shown from middle last year. So that obviously implies that prices are slightly higher in your province. And that means good things for commission and that the market, market is stimulated. So that's good news for the province, but overall fairly stable. Rentals, as you'll see the black line, the national median is higher than, uh, than um, Limpopo's median, but it doesn't vary that much. And if considering everything that is going on in the rental market, it is fairly stable and it kind of got back up to where it was. So this is stable and not negative news, but it is more affordable in Limpopo than elsewhere, which is a wonderful, which is a, a, a wonderful thing to know and which makes your scope quite, quite good. Then on to the next slide, which is Mpumalanga. So this is good. This is really nice to see, especially because if you look at the exponential growth in the views, which was 63% 2018 to 2019, 47% last year. And considering that to date, we have received over 700,000 views in the province and generated, and this is remarkable, 180,000 leads, then it really tracks well. What is so nice to see about this data is the relation between the sales views and the sales leads. If you look at the 47% increase last year and the 45% increase in leads, this implies that you are dealing with a lot of buyers. Cole made the distinction between buyers and shoppers, but this shows that views are converted to leads, which then leaves you with the opportunity to do your magic. So this is really promising, and it's very nice to, to know that the province is doing so well on both views and leads. If we look at rentals, still very much in line with the market. No, thanks very much in line with the market growth over the last year has not been a lot it is still not negative as far as views and interest is um, concerned and we have received in around 140,000 views to date this year conversion to leads leads are down considering that there was a lot of them and that the stats looked very good 14 percent is Seems a lot, but it's not that much, but it is negative growth. It makes complete sense. And this is something, a wave that we will have to ride out. It does, however, not indicate that there is not potential. The positive views, even though the growth is slight, is a good, is a good indicator of potential there. As to the top 50 suburbs, this is also a very nice one. Um, now, Sprite, that is fairly obvious. So much development going on there. I know Nkosi City is going to launch soon, and um, Now Sprite is truly buzzing, and it's and it's really a hub. Secunda, um, development, industrial, mining, doing well there. Again, another demographic that is interested in a suburb in your province. So if we go down, it's also very clear that all price classes, all um, LSMs and an entire demographic is visiting private property is interested. So a lot of potential there. Then the median for Mpumalanga, also fairly stable. Fairly stable, the national median you have seen and Mpumalanga is quite a bit lower than the national median and has picked up slightly 
over the last couple of months. That's a good sign. Rentals have come down. But if you look at the numbers, it is with a mere thousand rand from 85, around 8,500 rand to 7,500 rand. So it looks big on the graph and it is a decline, but it is by no means an indicator of zero activity or that prices have dropped remarkably. So again, this is not bad, if not good news to all of us. And with that, I am going to just say thank you. Thank you. And Ina, who is your very, very passionate relationship manager, I'm sure most of you have spoken to her, worked with her and met her. She's also loving um, face-to-face connections and visiting you guys in the province. She will post her detail in case you don't have it, as well as my contact detail in the chat. So please do feel free to make contact with us and see how we can assist and join hands and get you the best performance because both Limpopo and Pumalanga allows for it. There's a lot of scope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. Thank you very, very much. I'm just, before you get off the stage, let me just check if there are any questions for Claudia or for Carl while I have you. Um, thank you, Marion, for sending through um, the congratulations to the team and the happy birthday for our new brand identity, which is, of course, tomorrow. Um, no, I think, Claudia, you're good to go. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> okay, well, have a lovely afternoon, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so I think that brings us to the end of our session. Uh, we still have 46 people on the call, which is fantastic, um, Studio. We're not going to do the second mentee. Instead, I am going to acknowledge some of the questions that have been asked. APSA, please upgrade the future rent option. That was a question uh, or a request posted by Marena. Marena also asked, may we apply direct or must the bookkeeper apply for exemption of the trust account and that of course, has been um, directed at uh, Jan, and I think, Jan, you did answer it in the chat. And then, um, is there a backlog at the Harting Deeds office? Nerissa, I think you answered that question. And then the question that Jane had, which was around how long does an estate more or less take to be finalized? So if we look at the chats, some of the questions have been answered there. Nerissa, thank you for dropping your email address in the chat for us to look at. Yohit, thank you for dropping in the latest pay prop uh, rental index here. And then, Nerissa, you said that, um, at responding to Jane, an estate can take 90 days or longer to register. It depends on whether all information is up to date, example, rates and tax, and so on and so forth. Narissa, you are also responding to Marena's question around or request around upgrading the rental product. Um, you were saying that, hi, Marena, we look at 80% of future rental income. It all depends on rental in a particular area. We will also look at the quality of customer in customer investor, customer investor, and we can then use that or they can then use that to appeal for a higher consideration. Thank you so much, Narissa, for also responding to Chris's uh, question around the backlog, um, saying that the usual turnaround time is five days, and now it's taking between seven and 10 days to register a bond. Um, Chris, thank you for responding. Everyone, thank you so much for responding. And then Hanley, I like your comment. You saying that you love what Carl is saying right now. High time to skate the van die kaf. I hope I said that right. I know exactly what that means. Jan, your re response to Marena, I'm going to just acknowledge that. The regulations state that the property practitioners can submit the application. It is also the property practitioner who deposes the affidavit and not the auditor. I hope that answers your question. If you have any further questions, 
please don't hesitate to, um, to contact us, to reach out to myself, uh, Carl, Ben, Trish, Claudia, and also Ina. And then from a pay prop perspective, we still I think we still have your head and Jan here. And then uh, also big, big thank you to the APSA team. Uh, Nerissa, thank you for uh, popping your email address in there and answering some of those questions that we had. Wonderful. So we've got about 23 minutes left. We're going to leave the platform open so that you can still network with each other. And before I go, I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you to our partners, APSA. Thank you so much to your head smarts and Jan Davel from PayProp. Really appreciate the insights that you've shared with us, especially around uh, some of the uh, clauses in that Property Practitioners uh, Act that can help some of our some of our property practitioners um, think differently about how they're going to navigate around the, the new the changes in the act. Okay, and that concludes our presentations for the day. Thank you everyone for sharing your knowledge with us and sharing yourself with us. Don't forget to be able to get those uh, non-verifiable CPD points from AISA. Please follow the link that is being pasted into the chat right now. While I said the sessions are over, the event is going to stay open. And before I go, I'd like to say congratulations to Jane and Marena van der Merwe. You are our winners for the ne Nexus in Pumalanga and Limpopo um, uh, engagement competition. Chris, you have a question here. Any feedback on the EAAB issue with regards to FCCs? I think what we should do here, potentially, Jan, would it be possible for you to reach out directly to Chris so that <laughs> high five, real net polo kwane, well done, Marena. Thank you, Katrain, for that. Um, Jan, can I ask that you possibly reach out to Chris and maybe give him some feedback on the issue. I think he asked a question around FFCs. Um, and yeah, I think that brings us to the end of our, of our Nexus for today. If you are not subscribed to our industry newsletter, please do so. We're popping the link to subscribing into the chat as well in a minute. There we go. And thank you so much, Ina, for, for, um, for posting your email address and cell phone number into the chat. Um, before I go, can I just see a last couple of uh, emojis to know you're still in the room with us and have enjoyed your time with us? Um, Hanley Kruger, you're saying thank you, everyone. Enjoyed very much. Well, we enjoyed having you, Hanley. Jane, thank you for hosting an insightful uh, meeting. It's a, it's not on Zoom. The platform that we're using is called Vimo. You can see it right next to the live button. Quite an engaging and new platform. We'll definitely be rolling it out a little bit more um, in, in, in this year. If FFSs involve another issue, you will post a link. Thank you so much. Carl, thank you for that green heart. Flores, thank you so much for the for the money emoji. We must uh, claim that money emoji. Thank you, Jan. Uh, I can see the link there. Nerissa, thank you for joining. Thank you for joining with your team. Renee, Katrain, Jane, thank you. Magda van der Berg, thank you. Claudia, thank you. Johan, Chris, everyone. I wish you a very beautiful. Thank you, Veronica, for those beautiful yellow hearts. Thank you, Lena. Appreciate you dropping us that emoji. George and Marena, David or David, Flores, Magda. Bye, bye, Danke. With that, I'm going to say goodbye. We still have 20 minutes left in this environment. So don't rush off if you don't have to. Remember, switch on your camera and switch on your microphone and have a chat with, with the fellow colleagues in, in this uh, event today. Thank you so much, Gerda. Have a lovely, lovely Tuesday. Tomorrow we have another Nexus for another region. You're welcome to join. And we have another one. The final Nexus in this series will take place on Thursday. So from me, Tracy Miller, and the marketing and sales team, 
at Private Property. Have yourself a beautiful Tuesday.